Welcome to Lecture 5 of Psych 4981 on the History of Psychology. The title of our lecture is Testing Early Clinical Psychology and the Barriers Women Faced in Psychology. In this lecture, you're going to see there's a theme of sexism, or what we might also call patriarchy, uh, that kind of filters its way through the topics and also weaves itself into the time period that we're covering during this lecture. We also learn about mental testing which wasn't personality testing like the phrenologists did, but intelligence testing, and this in, fed, in turn fed into the eugenics movements at the time. And thirdly, we're going to talk about how American psychology became more organized and accepted as its own discipline. Now, the first thing I want to do is really kind of focus a little bit on this mental testing idea. And one of the key people to talk about, first of all, is Paul Broca, whom we actually have spoken about before when we talked a little bit about his work on brain localization and language. He was a French surgeon and neurologist in uh, the 19th century Paris. And he uh, was, like I said, very in, uh, important in the way that he used, you know, his methods of dissection and so on to understand how language was localized in the brain. But he had this other big interest, which was in craniometry, measuring the size of the brain and relating it to intelligence. So what he would do is he would take measurements of the head and the rest of the body, and then he would kind of look at how the, their sizes were related to their functions. And he believed that brain size was a good index of intelligence. And he concluded that men on average are more intelligent than women, and that this difference is greater than it was in the distance past. And he based this on two sets of data, that he had his own autopsies that he had conducted across four Parisian hospitals. There he collected data on 292 men's brains and 140 women's brains. He would weigh each brain, and he found that on average men's brains were 181 grams heavier than women's brains. The second thing he did was he looked at um, the cranial capacities of a number of prehistoric skulls that he had at his disposal, and he would measure the cubic volume of these skulls and found on average that in those prehistoric skulls there was about a 99.5 99 cubic centimeter difference between men and women's brains and that the male brains were larger than the female brains. He then looked at his measurements of contemporary brain volume and found that these differences between the sexes range between 130 and 221 centimeters. And he concluded that the brains of these primitive people were both smaller than modern human brains and that the sex differences uh, that existed back then were actually increasing over time. So there are kind of three assumptions underlying Broca's work on intelligence and cranial size. The first is here that mature adults were more intelligent than the elderly. So he often found that elder brains were smaller than um, brains that were like more middle-aged or younger adults. He believed that primitive people were less intelligent than modern people and that men were more intelligent than women. Note that he didn't actually perform any measures of intelligence on any of these groups. He just strongly believed that the brain size must be related to intelligence. And so he's making assumptions here that each of these groups is different in their intelligence based on their brain size. So kind of note the circular reasoning here, because anytime he found brain size differences between groups, he would say that it had something to do with their corresponding intellectual capacities. If you asked him what these differences in intellectual capacities were due to, he would say it's due to their brain size. So it's not really well defined. Um, but this kind of core belief that he had that women were more intelligent than, than I sorry, men were more intelligent than women was quite keeping with the times of 19th century France. In fact, this I whole belief about men's superiority over women, this patriarchy, was really a popular notion in France, and you can see it in a lot of writings of thinkers at the time. So for instance, the painter Renoir, known to be quite sexist in his beliefs uh, about men's superiority to women. For instance, here's a quote from him where he says, in ancient times, women sang and danced for free for the pleasures of being charming and gracious. Today, it's all for money, which takes away the charm. So he was really against women being paid to perform professionally. He was against them as scientists and many other uh, thinking um, kind of professions. Here's another quote. This one comes from Gustave Le Bon in 1879. He was one of the premier French scholars of the time and sort of an early founder of social psychology. He says, in the most intelligent races among the, the Parisians, there are a large number of women whose brains are closer in size to those of gorillas. 
than to the most developed male brains. So note here that he's saying at this point, they now believe that some women's brains are actually much larger than male brains. And because they're so big, they're closer to the size of gorillas. Um, this inferiority is, so, inferiority is so obvious that no one can contest it for a moment. Only its degree is worth discussion. All psychologists who've studied the intelligence of women recognize today that they represent the most inferior forms of human evolution and that they are closer to children and savages than to an adult civilized man. They excel in fickleness, inconstancy, absence of thought and logic, and incapacity to reason. So here you have a, a scientist, a scholar, who's saying that the data support the, the fact that women are inferior to men. And so you can imagine if you were trying to deal with issues like women should have the right to vote or should be able to have their own jobs or whatever it was that you were arguing for equality between men and women, you had people like Laban and other uh, scholars arguing, no, the data don't support that, don't let that happen. All right, now moving on a little bit into our um, to over to the UK, you'll remember that we talked about Francis Galton back in lecture three and how he had this preoccupation with ranking people on all sorts of different measures particularly for their accomplishments and their belief in what he believed was their genius. And he, with his um, students, even though he wasn't really at a university, developed tests of intelligence that he showcased, for example, at this international exhibition in what was called the Anthropomet Anthropometric Laboratory, where people could buy a ticket and come in and get measured, and then they would use their data to kind of um, look at how these different measures were related to accomplishments. One of the important people who came to his lab was this fellow, James McKean Cattell. And I want to spend some time talking about him because he turns out to be a pretty important person in the history of psychology. Cattell grew up in an intellectual family. His father was the president of a small college in Pennsylvania. After he had studied philosophy for a short time in Germany, he returned to America and there he entered Johns Hopkins University to study philosophy on a fellowship. And in his second semester, he was exposed to the psychological methods of G. Stanley Hall. When that fellowship was not renewed at the end of the year, he returned to Germany and he sought out Wundt at Leipzig and spent three years with him in, from 1883 to 1886 and earned his PhD in psychology as the first American student under Wundt. After he left Leipzig, he then went to Cambridge, England and then enrolled at St. John's College with the intent to study medicine, but was instead persuaded to continue his work on the physiological and experimental psychology that he had started back at Leipzig. He had met and admired Galton while he was in England and spent some time in this anthropometric laboratory as an assistant. And he actually worked as a tester during the exhibits. And he became interested in Galton's investigations of individual differences. So he interrupted his time in England for a return trip to Leipzig in the summer of 1887 to visit Wundt and Fechner. And then he returned to the United States to lecture at the University of Pennsylvania in Philadelphia and at Bryn Mawr College, where he was offered an instructorship. Um, that had been arranged for him by his father. He returned for good from England in 1889 to become a professor in psychology at Penn, in which he claimed to be the first chair labeled simply as psychology. So he's claiming that this is the first time a position was actually uh, designated as a professor in psychology, and this even happened before William James got that. This is kind of interesting. This kind of shows you some of the topics that he uh, taught while he was at Penn. Um, you can see that he's got a course called Elementary Psychology. It's one hour. It meets at Mondays at noon. He's got a class called Scientific Methods in Psychology that's taught from Thursdays from 3 to 6. He's got Experimental Psychology and Comparative Social and Animal Psychology. I also like the fact that if you look at the ba the bottom there, he's got um, a course called Advanced Psychology for two hours on Saturdays from 11 to 1. So he was teaching classes on Saturday. Now, while he was at Penn, he was able to set up a laboratory. And his laboratory uh, used a lot of the same kinds of tests and instruments that he had used when he was with Galton back in London. Here's an example of one of these instruments. Uh, he's, he's doing a reaction time experiment here. It's using a hip chronoscope and what was called the Cattell gravity chronometer. And um, what was going on here is that the time taken for the subject who's on the left to begin reading a word displayed in the chronometer was being determined. And the hip chronoscope is started by the dropping of the screen. It's stopped by the subject reading the word aloud, which opens the lip key in the subject's mouth. So 
the person's got a little key there in his mouth if you can see it and when he speaks it's actually going to cause a little circuit to flip and then they can measure precisely how long it takes for him to read that word. Now, Cattell developed other kinds of tests that had been inspired by his original work with um, Galton. Um, and I just wanted to give you an example of some of these other ones. Mental testing, by the way, was actually coined by him, that phrase, mental testing. And he pretty much devoted the rest of his career on the development of measures of individual differences. And a lot of these are, like I said, really similar to what Galton had. Um, these are, by and large, measures that were associated with psychophysics and quantitative experimental psychology, and probably very few of them are actually going to strike you as being intelligence tests. Uh, here's uh, examples. Like, for instance, one of them was the dynamo dynamometer uh, pressure, which was uh, basically what you could script, squeeze your hand to see how hard you could squeeze your hand, strength of the hand squeeze. A test called rate of movement, which was how quickly your hand could, be, could move a distance of 50 centimeters. So you just hold it in position, and then you quickly move it 50 centimeters. How long does that take? Uh, sensation of areas was a two-point threshold. How far apart on the skin must two stimuli be to be detected as two different stimuli instead of just one? Pressure causing pain, the amount of pressure applied to the forehead at which the subject reports pain. Reaction time for sound, the time required to respond to a sound. Judgment of time, the accuracy with which a 10-second interval can be estimated and letter span, the number of letters that can be repeated after hearing a series of letters. Um, maybe that last one is not the only one that seems like anything like what we might call an intelligence test today, but all of these supposedly measured one's mental ability or one's intelligence. And um, these are the kind of measures that he developed in these tests that he developed in, at Penn. There were other kinds of instruments too, and here's some photos that I have of these. These aren't actually from his lab, but these are the kind of things that he had developed and would have been used by other people. This one's called the Moss Ergograph. An ergograph is being used by this tester to measure endurance of grip. So you can see the boy has got his hand in something there. He's going to grip onto something, and this grip um, is thought to be a measure of determination or grit. The ergograph originally was designed to study fatigue by Angelo Masso, who has been referred to often as the father of sports psychology. The boy's right arm is secured to an armrest, and he's using his middle finger to raise and lower a weight that is hanging almost to the floor. The pulley arm with a the stylus then scraps, scraps carbon black from the slowly moving chemograph that the tester is standing behind, and this would provide a permanent record of the length and the frequency of the poles. So he's trying to pull his, with just his middle finger, this weight up and down from the floor. Here's another kind of mental testing with what's called the wet spirometer. This instrument would measure vital capacity, which was the maximum volume of air that's exhaled after deep inhalation. Yes, can you believe that? You would take a breath and then exhale it, and as long as you, as whatever it would take for you to exhale that fully would be what it was measuring. And supposedly vital capacity was related to age, sex, and physical condition, but at that time it was also believed to be related to intellectual status. And the inner drum of the spirometer rises as the child blows into the mouthpiece, and then the level of displacement can be read on a scale on the side of the instrument. And then we have a volometer. The child here is instructed to raise his heels a quarter of an inch off the platform, and the indicator at the top of the upright shows the elevation of his heels and registers any tremors he has while he's standing there on his toes. When the heels touch the platform, as would seem to be the case in this picture, then a buzzer sounds, and this test was required to measure will and persistency, determination, and pluck or spunk. So these were all measures of the mental tests and uh, mental ability. And again, it probably seems odd that this is the way they thought about it, but that's what they did back then. So he performed some collaborative experiments on psychophysics there at Penn, and then he left for a new position at Columbia University in 1891. He spent the remainder of his academic career there, and during the 25 years that he was at Columbia, he became the leading producer of PhDs in psychology, and some of his noteworthy students were Woodworth and Thorndike, who we'll cover at a later lecture. However, uh, Cattell had to leave Columbia in 1917 because he had frequent arguments with the university's administration, especially over the drafting of inductees for World War I. So he was very much in, against the Americans getting involved in World War I. And I think what was happening at the time was that the university was 
um, trying to recruit the male students there to join the army and they would actually start to do drills and things like this and he would constantly argue with the university and say you shouldn't be doing this you should be letting these students be alone uh, don't let them go sent off to the war and because of that he was forced to leave so he left in 1917 never to work in a university again however he stayed busy and did all sorts of things um, here's just sort of a, um, a, a, a CV of other things that uh, that Cattell did for psychology both before he left Columbia and after. So for example, he founded the journal with James Mark Baldwin called Psychological Review in 1894 and was the editor for the first 10 years and made it the official journal of the American Psychological Association in which the presidential addresses would appear from the beginning. And this basically won out more respect than what G. Stanley Hall had done with the American Journal of Psychology. In fact, even to this day, Psychological Review is probably considered the most uh, preeminent journal in psychology. So if you get a paper in psychology, Psychological Review, you get a lot of kudos for that. In 1895, he purchased the journal Science, and the ownership of this he held on to until after his death in 1944. In 1900, he added Popular Science Monthly to his list of journals that he owned. When he sold its name in 1915, he replaced it with something called Scientific Monthly, which later became a journal that members of the AAAS, uh, sorry, the AAAS could choose as an alternative to science. In 1906, he began what was called the American Men of Science with 4,000 names that would include women in it. This is very much like something that Francis Galton would have started. He introduced a method of starring the most eminent people in 12 sciences in which psychology had its share of stars, 50 psychologists among 1,000 starred scientists in the first edition. And if, in fact, he included himself as one of those 50 psychologists. He also introduced an order of merit ranking whereby 10 competent leaders in each field of science would arrange the workers in rank order, and then he would average the results to produce an overall ranking. This was done for 200 leading psychologists in 1903, and the names with their scores were revealed for the first time in his 1929 address as the president of the Ninth International Congress of Psychology. These were ranks in 1903. For the first 10 were James Cattell, Hugo Munsterberg, Hall, Baldwin, Titchener, Royce, Ladd, Dewey, and Jastrow. So you see Cattell himself ended up in the top 10. Although he was no longer affiliated with Columbia after 1917, he kept really busy with all these publications. He was not forgotten by the scientific community. In fact, was elected as the president of the AAAS, and this is the American Academy for the Advancement of Science. It's probably the, one of the most prestigious scientific organizations in the United States. He was their president in 1925, and he was also, like I said, the president of the International Congress in 1929. So his place in the history of American psychology isn't probably so much for these scientific contributions that turned out to me um, rather trivial in the sense that these mental tests didn't really do anything, but more because of his role in furthering the professional organization of psychology in relationship to these established sciences. Here's an example of um, him serving on the board of trustees for the Smithsonian Institution in Washington, D.C. So I got a little red box there around him so you can see what he's doing. Now, the next person I have on today's list of topics, um, I had a hard time figuring out exactly where to put him in. He's kind of important. He's not directly related to testing, um, but uh, he's sort of an important key figure of this era, and that's Edward Titchener. Okay? So Titchener was born in England, Chichester, England, and then he went off to Oxford between 1885 and 1890. After that, he went to Leipzig, and he worked both with Wundt and Kulpa, whom uh, we'll talk about um, in another lecture. He was offered a position then at Cornell in 1892, and he stayed there for the rest of his life. So Cornell University is in upstate New York in the United States. So you have this Englishman who got a professorship in psychology there. And in 1895, he became a full professor at the age of 28, which was quite the accomplishment. So it just shows you how ambitious he was and how qualified he was. By 1900, he had published more than 60 research articles, which is about 7.5 pubs per year um, since he had started publishing. Now, Titchener was known for a school of psychology called structuralism. And the way he viewed this was just like that biology can be broken down into structure and function in terms of anatomy versus physiology. He thought the same thing could happen with psychology. He said those other people who are interested in psychological functions, he called them the functionalists. Titchener thought that psychology wasn't really ready for that yet. It needed to make sense 
it didn't make sense to study the function when we didn't fully understand the structure of consciousness. So he thought it was important first for psychology to be focusing on structure. And once we have that all delineated and understand the elements of consciousness, then we would be ready to study the functions. One of the caveats, though, he wasn't actually really interested in unconscious processes, so you had to rely on processes that the subject could report on and that therefore favored introspection as his method of choice. And of course, that reflects the fact that he had been trained by Wundt in Germany for his PhD. He thought it was very important, important for students and researchers in psychology to learn the right terms, and, and there was a lot of training about the languages one should use as a subject and thought it also was very important to avoid what he called the stimulus error, which was to use words to describe the object rather than one's experience of the object. So he's really interested in your conscious process of seeing an object and how it makes you feel, how it makes you, um, you know, what tensions might be involved and so on. So that's what the uh, training is going to be for introspection. So once he kind of like mapped this all out, this, this is what he says is the domain of psychology, at least at this point in time, structuralism, he then takes on a uh, next phase of his life and becomes very important in terms of teaching psychology students. So you can see there he is in his home studio. Now he did a lot of time working with his graduate students, spent a lot of time with it, working with graduate students who would bring them to his house um, and try to get them to read a lot of different things. He would give them advice about all sorts of different topics. He even put together a music group uh, for graduate students because he really wanted them to live and breathe psychology and he had them come to his house for a lot of their training. So that was an important way that he taught them was this sort of creating a community of, of psychology researchers. Um, he also wrote a bunch of textbooks at this time. Just an example of some of them, The Outline of Psychology, 1896, Primer of Psychology, 1898, a four-volume set called Experimental Psychology between 1901 and 1905, Lectures on Thought Processes, a Textbook of Psychology, a Beginner of Psychology, and probably the most important thing were these things called the manuals in 1901 and 1905. And these are laboratory manuals that would be used in a course called psychology laboratory. So it was very important in every year of the one psychology training that the student would spend a lot of time in the lab and to learn the methods of psychology. And these manuals were sort of like the, the Bible. They would tell you exactly how to do these methods. Largely, again, focused on introspection as the main method and how to properly use um, the right words and so on. In his instructor's manual, he has this sort of jokey thing that you, he said that the teachers could tell their students about how to fail their course in laboratory psychology. So these are all things that one could tell uh, the students, like, do not accept any general explanation under any circumstances. Cherish the belief that your mind is different in its ways from working from all other minds. Call upon the instructor at the slightest provocation if he is busy. Stroll about the lab until he can attend to you. Work as noisily as possible. Converse with your partner in the pauses of the experiment upon current politics or athletic records. Explain when you enter the laboratory that you have long been interested in experimental psychology. Describe the telepathic experiences or accounts that aroused your interest. And make it a rule, always to be a quarter of an hour late for the laboratory exercises. In this way, you throw the drudgery of preliminary work upon your partner while you can still take credit to yourself for the regularity of your class attendance. So of course, this is all very tongue in cheek, but you can see that this is how um, his tone was in these books and the sort of sarcasm he would do when he was trying to teach people the methods of um, structuralism and methods of psychology, I should say, more to the point. Again, you can see here's a, a picture of, a, of the psychology laboratory, I think at Cornell, and um, how the students would come there. You can see the chairs are down there in the bottom. And so the laboratory would be to, to teach the student how to actually use these different kinds of instruments. Another important thing that, that uh, Titchener did was he created this group called the Experimentalists in 1916. For some reason, and I'm not really sure why, Titchener never actually went to the American Psychological Association meetings, never was a president, but he did create his own society called the Experimentalists. And you can see him there in the front row. He's the guy with the big beard, the sort of big guy, third from the left. And um, he's look, ho holding on to a cigar. 
one of his students um, during this time was a guy named Boring, and I mentioned him before because it's such a funny name, but he became the first major historian of psychology. And so he would write these big, thick volumes on the history of psychology, and in those books he would always regularly feature this difference between structuralism versus functionalism. And as a result of that, he kept alive that division in psychology, even though structuralism as a school of thought died out decades earlier than that. So for a long, long time, people heard about structuralism, not because it was really an active part of psychology, but because it was in these books that his student had made sure to cover that topic in his books. All right, so there we have Titchener. Like I said, he's sort of a little deviation from the rest of the topics of today's lecture. I want to get back, though, to mental testing. And this time we're going to jump from the United States over to France and go to Alfred Bernay. Now, in France, there was a very different approach to measuring intelligence. As opposed to Galton and Cattell's method of these indirect measures of things like, you know, you know your physical strength and so on, Binet championed the direct measure of complex mental operations. Now, he was born in Nice in France. His father was a physician, as were both his grandfathers. Because his parents separated when he was very young, his mother, who was a successful artist, mainly raised him. He initially studied medicine, but he turned to psychology instead, and he began to read the works of Darwin, Galton, and the British empiricist. He never received a formal education in psychology. He began his career in psychology, though, by working with Jean-Martin Charcot, whom we're going to meet next week. Um, he was a famous psychiatrist, neurologist in Paris who was at this big hospital in Paris. And so Vinay went over there and started working with him. And while he was there, he conducted research on hypnotism using magnets. But his findings were later found to be flawed due to the patient that he was working with was being highly suggestible and probably a lot of demand characteristics were going on. So sort of out of shame, he had to resign his position with Charcot in 1890. Without this professional position, Binet then directed his attention to the study of intellectual growth, and he did this with his two daughters, who were two and a half and four and a half at the time. The tests he created to investigate his children's mental operations were very similar to those that Jean Piaget would later devise in Switzerland. He would ask, for example, which of two piles contained more objects and found that the answer was not determined by the number of objects in the piles, but the amount of space that the piles took up on the table. He also investigated how well his daughters could remember objects that he first showed them and then removed from sight. He also employed a number of tests that had been used by Galton and Cantell to measure things like visual acuity and reaction time because he thought some of these might really be more related to mental operations. So in 1890, he published three papers describing his research on his daughters, and in 1903 he published uh, The Experimental Study of Intelligence, which summarized his longitudinal study of the intellectual growth of his daughter. So you can see here in this photo. In 1891, he joined the Laboratory for Physiological Psychology at the Sorbonne, the major university in France, where he performed research in such areas as memory, the nature of childhood fears, the reliability of eyewitness testimony, also did work in abnormal psychology, and handwriting analysis. He also investigated the individual differences in the perception of ink blots uh, long before the famous work of Rorschach. So some historians have argued that Binet was the father of experimental psychology in France and had more of an impact on American psychology than did Wundt. So they would say, we should be spending more time talking about Binet and his influence than, for instance, uh, the way uh, Wundt might have influenced the rest of the world. All right, so again, we're bringing him up at this point because we want to talk more about his tests of intelligence. So... He uh, had this colleague, Theodore Simone, who was working as an intern at a large institution for mental retardation, and he asked Binet to supervise his doctoral research, and Binet agreed and viewed this as an opportunity to have access to a large subject pool. In 1899, Binet joined the Free Society for the Psychological Study of the Child, an organization that sought scientifically valid information about children, especially about their educational problems. And this is because in 1882, the French government had mandated primary education for both sexes, ages 6 to 14. So now all of a sudden, all children have to go to school who are between the ages of 6 and 14, both boys and girls. And as a result of that, they um, have this sort of new need to understand the differences between these kids' abilities. He wants, they want to have a better understanding of um, maybe some of these children are having more problems than other kids. So, like I said, he was 1903, he was appointed to this 
uh, government uh, group to study the problems of children who may be retarded and in the French schools. So they, one of their immediate concerns is to be able to have a, like a good way to identify such children. At the time, people were just sort of using variations of Galton's tests to detect mental retardation. And Binet noted that because of these tests, the children who were blind or deaf would often be, often be classified erroneously as having mental deficiencies. So their strategy was to identify a normal and an intellectually subnormal group of children, test them in different ways, and determine what best distinguished those two groups. Because of his early work, Binet believed that some of these tests could focus on higher mental operations. So in 1905, Binet and Simone offered their Binet-Simone scale of intelligence as a valid way to distinguish between normal children and children with mental deficiencies. It consisted of 30 tests ranging in difficulty from simple eye movements to abstract definitions. Three of the tests measured motor development and the other 27 were designed to measure cognitive abilities. These tests were arranged in order of difficulty so that the more tests a child passed, the more they supposedly had um, developed their intelligence. And the scale was administered to children between the ages of two and 12. And they found that the tests one through six could be passed by most children under the age of two, but children with slight or moderate retardation could pass some or all of these tests, but severe retardation could not. Most of the tests between seven and 15 could be passed by normal children two to five years old, but with increasing severity of mental retardation, fewer of these tests could be passed. And then finally, tests 16 through 30 could be routinely passed by normal children between the ages of five and 12, but children with even slight retardation had a great difficulty with them, and children with moderate and severe retardation usually could pass none. So you get the idea of how this is working. They're working on it so that they kind of assume that there's a development of the, of the cognitive ability of the child that's changing over time. This is akin to um, some of the work of John Dewey that we talked about at the last lecture, how Dewey didn't believe that the child's brain was like, you know, ready, just an empty adult brain that needed information put into it. They're really showing that uh, the intellectual ability of the child changes as the child gets older. But within each age group, you could kind of tell the difference between kids who were typical and those kids that they called suboptimal. In 1908, they revised this scale, and their goal now is to go beyond simply distinguishing normal children from children with retardation to perhaps distinguishing among levels of intelligence for normal children. So the tests were administered to a large number of normal children from the ages of 3 to 13. If 75% or more of the children of a certain age passed a particular test, the test was designed to that age level. For example, most, most four-year-old children could copy a square, but they couldn't copy a diamond. And more specifically, it was found that only a minority of three-year-olds could copy a square. And a majority of four-year-olds could copy a square, but essentially all five-year-olds could. So if a five-year-old child passed only the test typically passed by four-year-olds, but not a five-year-old's, he, he or she was thought to have below average intelligence. And this revised scale had 58 different tests in it. The 1911 revision of the test included more normative data about adults, who were actually people in their, who were 15 years old, and provided exactly five tests for each age level. And this allowed a score uh, where you could get something, a score between one and five for each of the different year gradations. Now, Binet warned that ex with extreme caution should be taken in interpreting a child's intellectual age. Children whose intellectual age was two or more years behind their chronological age could probably have trouble in a standard school program and would need special attention. But even in the latter case, this poor test performance did not necessarily mean that the child had mental deficiencies. Before such a label was applied, the test administer, administrator had to ensure that the child was healthy and motivated when he or she took the test and that he or she was knowledgeable enough about French culture to understand the reflections of that culture on the test. So these are sort of modern uh, warnings that we give right now when we talk about different kinds of intelligence tests. So it's pretty remarkable that you know more than 100 years ago, Binet and Simone had these same ideas with their scale. Now what happened next, it was a German psychologist, a guy named William Stern, who introduced the term mental age. And he also suggested that the mental age be divided by one's chronological age, and this would yield something called an intelligence quotient or an IQ. So it was Stern who came up with this formula, you take your mental age, that was defined by passing these different tests that Binet and Simone had, 
and then you would divide that by your chronological age and multiply it by 100. So if your mental age was exactly where your chronological age was, like you are 10 and you're performing at the 10 range, then you would have a IQ of, of 100, right? Because it'd be one over one, I'm sorry, 10 over 10 divided by 100 or um, 100. So the IQ of a score that's higher than 100 is supposed to represent somebody whose mental age is more advanced over their chronological age. Somebody who has an IQ less than 100 has a mental age that's behind their chronological age. Now Stern developed that and Binet was opposed to the use of this uh, quotient. He believed that intelligence was too complex to be represented by a simple term or number. Um, and what happened though, of course, was that Stern's uh, uh, formula was easy and sort of won out over Binet's opposition of a more complex approach. So you can see here that this is kind of a something we still talk about today in terms of IQs. There's clubs that are based on your IQ scores and so on. But in any event, Binet and Simone's test was popularly adopted and it was used throughout most of the world by the beginning of World War I. It had been translated into a lot of different languages. The final thing I want to just mention about um, Binet is that he really didn't believe that intelligence was fixed. He thought there was a certain amount of changeability to it. And he said, if we consider that intelligence is not a single function, indivisible and of a particular essence, but rather that it is formed by the chorus of all the little functions of discrimination, observation, retention, etc., the plasticity and extensibility of which have been determined, it will appear undeniable that the same law governs the whole and its parts, and that consequently anyone's intelligence is susceptible to being developed. He believed that with practice, training, and above all method, we manage to increase our attention, our memory, our judgment, and literally to become more intelligent than we were before. Improvement goes on in this way until the time we reach our limit. So this gave a lot of uh, weight to the argument that we could still do a lot of work. Maybe even if you do uh, identify some children as, as being of special needs children that you, if you worked with them properly and did the right kind of training, they could actually improve their intelligence. They could still, they weren't stuck in whatever their uh, bin was there based on these scores. And so it had a lot more flexibility to it. If you kind of look to the present, this is sort of uh, an idea that you find in the work of Carol Dweck. Um, and this is just from an article that was published in 2007 about her work. Um, she says here, beliefs about intelligence play a key role in children's motivation to learn as well as their achievement in school. And she discovered that parent, students who believe that their intelligence is fixed and cannot be expanded tend to show less effort in school and be more, may be more likely to give up when things get tough. She says they are less likely to be fully engaged in school and perform to their potential, she said. But students who believe that intelligence can be expanded, that it isn't predetermined or fixed, tend to remain fully engaged even when the work is hard for them. And that sort of kind of makes intuitive sense in the sense that if you are like Binet and you believe that you could use certain kinds of exercises and training to improve your intelligence, no matter what your original intelligence was tested at, you're gonna believe then it's got more uh, expandability here, it's not so fixed, and you're gonna be able to possibly stay more engaged with stuff at school. But if you strongly believe that you're just stuck with whatever your intelligence is, it's fixed, then you might wanna give up sooner and therefore um, not try as hard for certain things that challenge you. All right, so that's, I think, uh, kind of an interesting way that you see a link from the present back to the past. The next individual I wanna talk about briefly here is Charles Spearman. You actually know his name for taking a course in statistics where you learned about correlation, like the Spearman, uh, Spearman's correlation. Um, now, he was an English psychologist, and he administered various examinations to groups of children, and then he turned attention to correlations among these test scores. So you can see here he came to psychology at the age of 34. He had done work with Galton. And again, remember Galton wasn't actually at a university, but he was very much influenced by Galton's ways of measuring intelligence and using the statistics that he developed with Galton about things like regression to understand how all these factors work together. He was eventually offered a position at the University of London in 1904. I think that's the University of College London and then um, University College of London. And then he um, started doing this work on correlations and he basically developed the beginnings of factor analysis that we use today. So he would just take the correlations among all these different tests 
and try to see which things kind of went together and which ones didn't. And it ended, up from his, it ended up from his statistical analysis that he postulated that there were two factors of intelligence, what he called specific factors and another one called the general factor. So he assumed that um, the absence of a correlation between some test and something else showed you that you had a specific factor. And so you might be really good at one particular kind of intelligence, but it has nothing to do with your overall general intelligence. So your one kind of thing might be that you're really good at memory or that you have a really good reaction time or something like that, but that might not actually correlate very well with your overall intelligence. Your overall intelligence is your general factor, your G. And so he uh, thought of intelligence as consisting of both G and S, and he believed to be S characteristic of simple tasks and G to be more characteristic of complex tasks that would involve lots of different abilities. So this contrasted with the more commonly held opinion probably because of, uh, of the work on I IQ that intelligence was unitary and so people immediately started to work on him. Uh, so you can contrast that with Binet in the sense that he, um, he thinks that there's sort of a, a unitary nature of intelligence and then he also talked a lot more about inheritance of intelligence. And interestingly, what happened was that because of Stern's work on the quotient, IQ quotient, and his talk about what he called the general factor of G, that IQ that Spearman had come up, I'm sorry, that Stern had come up with became synonymous with G, this notion of Spearman's. So again, what I'm trying to say here is that Binet, you know, probably thought of all this stuff as being really complicated and would like to talk about all of your tests and all the different scores that you had. He didn't really like having a single number or two or three numbers to describe a child's intelligence, but Stern had come up with this sort of easy way to come up with one number for your IQ, and because Spearman believed that um, we had an overall underlying sort of intelligence where all these things sort of correlated together, what did correlate together would be the general factor or the G, that that must be what the IQ is actually measuring. So that's how these two things became sort of synonymous and have been like that for the last 100 years. Next person I want to talk about is Henry Goddard. Um, and just say a little bit about him. He, um, he had... Um, he worked in various different uh, kinds of schools and when he, um, yeah, so I'm sorry, when he went, and so in 1888 in Vineland, New Jersey, this New Jersey training school uh, for feeble-minded girls and boys had opened up. So in 1888, you have the feeble-minded girls and boys school. And when its director quit, Goddard was asked to take it over. And Goddard liked it because, um, he wanted to use it as a laboratory to do research. So he actually became the director of the laboratory in 1906 because of G. Stanley Hall, whom he had done his degree with. Uh, so Goddard had actually received his PhD in psych from Clark, blah, blah, blah. So our next person is Henry Goddard. Goddard had received his PhD in psychology from Clark University in 1899. He was one of G. Stanley Hall's students. Goddard, like most of his peers at the time, had no prior experience with mental retardation. And so what happened was he got this job because he, um, because of his connections to G. Stanley Hall. He took over as the directory of the laboratory in 1906 of this New Jersey training school. Now, the New Jersey training school in Vineland, New Jersey, was actually a school for feeble-minded girls and boys, boys and girls that um, seemed to have some sort of mental retardation. So he gets this job to go to Vineland to um, test these kids and develop sort of like an observation of them, almost like to do research on them. And because, like I said, he didn't have much experience with mental retardation, he just started using the same sort of, sort of laboratory tests that um, other people had uh, used. He soon found out that this was unsuccessful using these kind of brass instrument tests. So he consulted with several eminent American psychologists and found that none of them could really help him. So he said that after two years, my work was so poor, I had accomplished so little that I went abroad to see if I could get some ideas. And he went off to Europe and he came back with the Benet Simone scales and he translated them into English and started giving these tests to his kids that were at this Vineland school. And so he started to talk about how there were different levels of substandard or sub, 
levels of intelligence from the normal intelligence. And he's the person who coined the term a moron. So if you ever hear anybody use the word moron, it was actually Goddard who talked about moron. In fact, if you look it up in the Wikipedia, they say, Moron is a term once used in psychology to denote a mild intellectual disability. So sort of in, in between average intelligence and mental retardation was somebody who was a moron. And you can see here it was coined in 18, 1910 by him. It was used to describe a person with a mental age and adulthood of between 8 and 12 on the Binet scale. And it was once applied to people who had an IQ of 5170 being superior in one degree to imbecile and superior in two degrees to idiot. The word moron, along with others, included idiotic, imbecilic, stupid, and feeble-minded. And these were all considered valid descriptors in the psychology community. That's now, no, nobody would use this, these words now in psychology. Now, although Bonnet and Goddard corresponded, they apparently never did actually meet personally. Goddard first learned about the scale when he was in Russell, Brussels. Um, and he then came back and, like I said, used this scale with these American psychologists. He gave it to 400 patients of the violin scale and then compared it to the ratings by the school teachers and the staff members. And he noted that even in cases of disagreement, the test results agreed with the opinion of at least one or more of the raters. And this led him to believe that these tests were actually valid. So he translates the scale into English. He coins the term moron. And this the English versions of these scales then get start to be passed around among the American psychology community. And he actually becomes quite important then around the turn of the century uh, when the government in the United States decides that they're going to test immigrants that are coming into the country. And they've basically passed laws that they're not going to let people in who are uh, too low in their intelligence. So he advises the government about which tests to give to people who are coming into the country. And as a result of these tests, these people might be sent back to their home country, would not be allowed to enter the United States as a, and later become a citizen. So Goddard was quite influential on that. Um, he also was very interested in issues about mental retardation, and he called his group the Feeble-Minded Club. Again, this was a perfectly acceptable, to, acceptable term back then, calling people who were below average intelligence feeble-minded. And so you can see here is the meeting of the feeble-minded club, and Goddard is there in the front row in the center, and then these are the other people around him who also are interested in this same topic. You'll notice that in the back row on the far right, the guy with his hair parted in the middle, his name is Lewis Terman, and we're going to be talking about Terman next. Lewis Terman was obsessed with intelligence. He had deep sympathy for the gifted, particularly, so he was more interested in the upper end of this continuum. And he was interested, He, I think probably because he identified with the yearnings and frustrations of children who were more gifted. This likely goes back to his childhood in rural Indiana, where he was the 12th of 14 kids that were born in a prosperous farming family. Uh, his, he preferred intellectual games and reading over sports or other outdoor play, but he felt physically outclassed by his playmates. Back then, few farm kids would stay in school past the eighth grade, but Terman was officially ambitious for more education. And so that drive, fueled by taking out some loans from his family, led him to go to the local teacher's college and then to Indiana University and finally to Clark University, which by then was a top flight school for psychological research. He completed his PhD dissertation comparing the mental and physical abilities of smart and dull children, kind of maybe reflecting some of his interests from his own childhood. At that time, psychology had just established itself as a separate discipline from philosophy at that, um, at the, you know, as, I, as we mentioned before. He suffered from recurring tuberculosis, and he moved in 1905 to the more um, better climate of Southern California with his wife, Anna, and they had these two children, Fred and Helen. And for the next five years, he worked as a high school principal and then as a professor of pedagogy at a teacher's college. In 1910, St Stanford offered him a job in its fledgling department of education. He later moved to the psychology department, which he became the chair for 20 years. He was eager to measure human minds, and he plunged into intelligence testing soon after he arrived at Stanford. The original intelligence test had been designed by Binet, and it was used as a way to identify slow children. Terman and his Stanford colleagues translated this test, adapted its content to U.S. schools, and then came up with new kind of age norms and standardizations so that the mean score would always be 100 on the test. <clears throat> 
<clears throat> and he called this the new version of, um, of the test, the Stanford Binet test, which is still actually used today. On this test, you'd have questions ranging from mathematical problems to vocabulary items. And this Americanized test was supposed to capture general intelligence, the G, again, that Spearman had talked about. He was a hardcore believer in heredity, and he believed that genetics alone dictated one's level of general intelligence. This vital constant, which he called an original endowment, wasn't altered by education or home environment or hard work. Um, he believed that uh, your intelligence was just inherited, and so he talked about the IQ. In 1916, he sprang the Stanford Binet test on America. He released this book called The Measurement of Intelligence, which was a book that was half instruction manual and half an IQ test, and also had a manif manifesto there about universal testing. Um, his little exam, which a child could complete in about 50 minutes, was about to revolutionize what students learned and how they thought of themselves. Few American children passed through the school system in the next 80 years without taking the Stanford Binet or one of its competitors. Terman's test gave U.S. educators the first simple quick, cheap, and seemingly objective way to attract students or, sorry, to track students or to assign them to different courses according to their ability. The following year, when the United States entered World War I, he helped design the test to screen army recruits. More than 1.7 million draftees took these tests, and how you did on the test would determine what job you got in the military during the war. So if you became a front-line uh, infantrymen, that might be because you had a lower score on the test. If you had a higher score on the test, you might become an officer. So the Stanford Binet made him a leader in this movement um, about me measuring. And remember, I already told you that Americans were really interested in the abilities of kids and so on. So everybody's interested in being tested. Um, they thought that tele intelligence was probably the most valuable human quality. And so they, their goal, the people who were around Terman, was to test every child and adult to determine their place in society. And so a lot of these intelligence testers were actually eugenicists. And so they saw this as a tool that they could use to help engineer a fairer, safer, fitter, more efficient uh, nation where people could be assigned to the proper jobs based on their scores on the Stanford Binet test. So the IQ just kind of really took off as this important determinant of everything that everybody was going to do. Now, as a result of this work on intelligence, he began this other study in the 1920s, uh, a study of genius. And what he was really interested in is like looking at what would happen if you could identify children at a young age who were um, at the genius level on the IQ test, on his Stanford Binet test, to see what would happen to them. So this test is called uh, the Genetic Study of Genius, and it was begun in 1921. The students were about 11 years old when they first did this, and what they did is they went around different elementary schools in Los Angeles, San Francisco, and Northern California, and they came up with a group of children who eventually um, had IQs of 135 or higher. He also had um, other children who were like control participants, but by the time that um, his study really took off, he had 1,528 people between the ages of 3 and 28 that were all really high on the IQ test, so they were all geniuses. As a group, they were overall overwhelmingly, oh, sorry, overwhelmingly white. They were urban and they were middle class. Nearly all of them lived in California. There were more boys than girls, so there were 856 boys, 672 girls. He, this puzzled Terman for the rest of his life. He, he wasn't really sure he understood why there'd be more boys that were genius than girls. Perhaps boys were actually smarter, kind of like going back to the ideas of Broca, or maybe the teachers were more likely to recommend them to participate in the study, but he never really got that figured out. There were other ways that they were lopsided in that there were only two African Americans, six Japanese Americans, and one American Indian in the study. They were tested every five years or so. So they were given the Stanford Binet or the recent, most recent version of the Stanford Binet and tracked every five years for as long as they could run the study. And as of 2003, the last time I can find anybody really talking about the study, there were still about 200 of these people alive. So uh, there have been some articles written about this. The people that were in the study were called termites because they were Terman's students or Terman's participants in his big study. 
Um, so you can see here, for instance, there's an article in the New York Times, 75 years later, the study is still tracking geniuses. So they had this nice longitudinal study where they could see what happened to these genius kids. At the time that this article was written, the termites were in their 80s. So um, I'm sure that mo there's probably nobody alive left from that particular sample. But anyway, um, they were looking at these traits that they had measured and what happened in terms of their longevity, in terms of their jobs, and so on. Um, here's another article about the, the, termite the termites in the Termin study published in 2009. And uh, this is again talking about some of the differences. If you look at this particular paragraph, it says here, his final group of termites averaged a whopping IQ of 151. Following up his group 35 years later, his gifted group at midlife definitely seemed to conform to his expectations. They were taller, healthier, physically better developed, and socially adept. And as described in his 35 year follow up, his group had an impressive array of accomplishments. Of just the gifted males, Terman's initial group consisted of 857 males. 70 had earned listings in American Men of Science, which, by the way, I got to point out to you, was started by Raymond Cattell. Three were elected to the National Academy of Sciences. 10 had entries in the Directory of American Scholars, and 31 appeared in Who's Who in America. And the list goes on. So what he was trying to show is that these termites were much more successful than the rest of the population. So this intelligence was linked. Intelligence measured at the age of 11 was, was linked to their success in later life. There have been other studies like this that kind of show similar things. For instance, here's a study that was published in 2009, the accomplishments across individual differences with the top 1% of general cognitive ability. And the way they're measuring intelligence here is using a popular test that's given in America called the SAT. So they give it to people at the age of 13, which isn't normally when you get the SAT. And then they followed them up um, over subsequent decades. And you can see that the people who are in the top quartile, the top 25%, were in this case the top 1% of general cognitive ability, um, were much more likely to have doctorates, much more likely to publish in STEM journals and have patents and so on. There's still papers coming out from this data set. This one I found uh, from 2017. This is looking at income differences among grade skippers and non-grade skippers in the term and sample. So it's a very large database. And I'm not sure exactly how you get access to it, but lots of researchers publish from it. This particular study is trying to show that the kids that were in this study who were allowed to skip a grade, you know, so they went from like uh, year three to year five, uh, were more likely to do better um, in their later life in terms of their success. And that's probably because the idea is that since they were so much smarter or brighter than the rest of the kids in their class, letting them go ahead a year, skipping a year, put them in an intellectual environment that was more suitable to their intelligence. Now, here's the other thing that's interesting about Terman. Terman was also, um, like I said, strongly believed in inherited, inheritance of uh, these qualities that the termites and others who were gifted had. And so he had a lot of connections to the eugenics movement. And in recent years in California, people are now more aware of this. There was a school in the um, near Stanford called Terman Middle School. So it was named after uh, Terman and also his son who became a professor and head of Stanford University. So it was called Terman Middle School for both the father and the son. But people discovered that Terman was um, you know, doing this work and talking about intelligence like 100 years before. And it was um, something that was brought up in the eugenics movement. And so people felt uncomfortable sending their child to a school named Terman Middle School. So there was a big uproar and the school was changed its name just there in 2018, where you can see that Terman Middle School is now going to be named in honor of Ellen Fletcher. And there was another school there uh, uh, called Jordan. And Jordan was another um, person who worked with Terman and also was considered a eugenicist. And so that school was also renamed um, to the Frank Green Jr. study. Uh, so, sorry, the Frank Green Jr. School. So you can see that, again, history is alive and well. We, here we are in 2018 and still people are showing up to a crowded hall there to discuss the changing of a school's name because these old psychologists had done things that were related to the eugenics movement. The next person in today's lecture also did testing, but what's also interesting about him is that he basically started what's called clinical psychology. His name is Leitner Whitmer. Whitmer was born in Philadelphia 
His father was a successful pharmacist. His family was a strong believer in education. All three children, two boys and a girl, all earned their doctoral degrees. Leitner got his PhD from Leipzig. His brother got an MD, and his sister also got an MD. Whitmer entered the University of Pennsylvania in 1884 and graduated in 1888. He was an outstanding undergraduate, and after receiving his bachelor's, he took a position teaching history and English at Rugby Academy, a secondary school in Philadelphia. And he stayed there for two years, and during this time, also he took some classes in law at the University of Pennsylvania because he was thinking about becoming a lawyer. But during his second year at rugby, he started taking classes in political science at the university. And sometime during that, he transferred to psychology. And this was due in part um, to the fact that in this year, um, James McKean Cattell had joined the Pennsylvania faculty. And Whitmer started working with Cattell and was offered an assistantship for uh, the following year. So he resigned his position at rugby and entered graduate school full time. Cattell put Whitmer to work gathering data on individual differences in reaction times. At that point, Whitmer expected to obtain his, obtain his doctorate there from um, Pennsylvania University with, with um, Cattell. But Cattell left to go to Columbia in 1891, and it was agreed that Whitmer would go to Leipzig to work on his doctorate with Wundt. And if it's successful, then he could come back over and take over the, come back to the United States and take over the Pennsylvania laboratory. So at Leipzig, Whitmer not only took courses with Wundt, but he also started, studied with Oswald Kulpa and several other people. Titchener was another of Wundt's students at this time, so he got to know Titchener. Whitmer's dissertation was on the aesthetic values of varying proportions. Wundt was known to discourage and even prohibit the study of individual differences in the laboratory, but somehow Whitmer was able to give considerable attention to these individual differences in his thesis, and he offered some speculations as to the, to the determinants of such differences. When he returned from Europe in 1892 at the age of 25, he was perceived, and he probably no doubt perceived himself, a strict experimental psychologist in this new mold. During his first few years on the Pennsylvania faculty, he taught courses, carried out research, and presented papers in experimental psychology. In fact, his last paper of a strictly experimental type was on psychophysics and appeared as late as 1905. For several years, he conducted research on individual differences in sensory perception variables. Even more interested to him in this period was the psychological aspects of pain. Now, you remember that the APA, you might remember, this was founded in 1892, and Whitmer, along with such other early figures as G. Stanley Hall, William James, and Cattell, were among its charter members, and its first annual meeting took place at the University of Pennsylvania in December of that year. And that's where Whitmer read two papers, one on the aesthetics of visual form, which was his dissertation top, topic, and another one on the individual differences in reaction time. In 1894, the university organized a special series on courses for public school teachers, and he became involved in these courses. And in March 1896, one of the students in his class discussed with him the problem of one of her students, a 14-year-old boy who was having extreme difficulty learning to spell, even though he seemed quite able in subsubjects. The youth was referred to by Whitmer as Charles Gilman. His teacher was Margaret McGuire, a dedicated woman who was also a psychology student at the university. In the words of Whitmer, she was, quote, imbued with the idea that a psychologist should be able, through examination, to ascertain the causes of a deficiency in spelling and to recommend the appropriate pedagogical treatment for its amelioration or cure, unquote. This attitude was strictly in accord with his own point of view. He reasoned that uh, that there was just probably a simple developmental defect in memory, and memory is the mental process in which the science of psychology is supposed to be furnishing authoritative knowledge. And so it appeared to him that if psychology was worth anything, then it should be able to assist this kind of case. So he examined Charles at length and worked out a systematic program for him. In his preliminary examination, he concluded that the boy had above average intelligence, showed good powers of reasoning, and expressed himself well in spoken language. However, his reading ability was deficient as his spelling. For example, he would, would read the word was, W-A-S, as saw, S-A-W. The only words that he could recognize at sight were a few monosyllables, such as the and an. All the other words he had to examine letter by letter and tried to combine the letter sounds before he could pronounce them. However, he had no difficulty remembering the sounds of different letters, and he had excellent visual memory for geometric figures and even for separate letters, though not for words. He was good at drawing, and he did very well in history and science. 
So in the fall of 1896, he began a program with Charles, trying to find some sort of technique that he could use with him. His underlying problem appeared to be an inability to fix in his memory the form of words, a condition that he designated as visual verbal amnesia. This intense remedial work continued through weekly visits to the clinic and almost daily instruction by the boy's teacher. And the aim was to teach Charles through persistent practice to recognize words without having to spell them first. These efforts gradually showed some success and the work was terminated in April, 1897, but Charles continued with these exercises at home. Although he never learned to read in a normal manner, his proficiency did reach the point where with some difficulty he could read ordinary material. Whitmer last saw him on July 9th, 1903, and at this time, Charles was physically ill of tuberculosis and had been compelled to withdraw from school, and he died of TB in January of 1907. But if you were to kind of look at his affliction that he had that brought him to see Whitmer in the first place, you would probably categorize it as a learning disability and perhaps be diagnosed as dyslexia or some sort of developmental reading disorder. During the spring of 1896, he also examined several other children who were referred to him. Whitmer hired a few local teachers to assist him in his clinical work, and he saw 26 cases that year. Most of the referrals were from schools, with some from medical settings. Parents were also involved. The most general cause of referral was some concern that they had over the child's developmental progress, either in some specific sense, like speech development, motor development, or they had a learning problem, or perhaps they might have had some sort of retardation. So by the late 1890s, Whitmer was supervising graduate students of his own, including Anna McKeague, who wrote her dissertation on pain perception in 1902 and was one of the first women to receive a psychology PhD in America. The other student was Edwin Twitmeyer, who studied the knee reflex for his dissertation and in the process discovered independently of Pavlov what we would later call the conditioned reflex. And he presented his dissertation results to the APA in 1905 and nobody really paid much attention. Now, one of the things that he did once he started this clinic was he started a journal called the Psychological Clinic. And it ran for several decades until 1935. And it was the leading and, in fact, the only clinical psychology journal and was instrumental in promoting and defining this new profession called clinical psychology. It would include research reports, theoretical articles, case studies, book reviews, and various notes and news items. Um, there, wasn't, there were other journals, like, for instance, the Journal of Abnormal Psychology, but they tended to kind of focus on case studies, whereas this journal, the Psychological Clinic, was more directly focused on diagnosis and treatment. So you have really the beginnings of clinical psychology here, where the clinic is really focused mainly on learning disorders at the beginning. In 1908, he established a residential school near Wallingford, Pennsylvania for the care and treatment of retarded and troubled children. And this fact indicates that by this time he was developing a private practice, perhaps the first by a clinical psychologist in addition to his university duties. So he was actually seeing people outside the university. In that same year, published, he published an extensive criticism of what he believed to be essentially fraudulent and unscientific mental health movements. And in the course of this discussion, he even criticized William James, who he thought was doing unscientific things by looking at hypnotism and seances and mysticism. And he described James as the spoiled child of American psychology. And so because of that, he became more and more estranged from the mainstream psychology establishment. Still, he had his clinic and his clinics included extensive training for students. And this basically became the first training programs, postgraduate programs in clinical psychology. So he spent the rest of his career there at Pennsylvania. He retired at the, in 1937 at the age of 70, and he died at the age of 89. He was the last of the surviving charter members of the American Psychological Association. What you can see in this slide, by the way, is uh, over on the left is by 1935 when the journal ended, um, he, they had sent out a questionnaire asking all the different clinics that existed in America at that time, there were like over a hundred of them, to kind of talk about who was on the staff and what their activities were. And if you look down there um, near the um, center of the page, you can see that for this clinic, the one that Leitner Whitmer ran, he says the reasons why they were, what they were seeing people for, and they, by the way, went from the ages of one year old to adult. They looked at conduct problems, educational problems, neglect problems, placement problems, educational vocational guidance problems, mental defects and abnormalities, superior children, speech defects, determination of mental status within the normal range, and personality problems. 
and then they got these these uh, referrals from schools and hospitals and social agencies. So interestingly, again, to see that he, these topics that he's covering are, are things that are just sort of new. They have a lot of practical benefit. People need these uh, services made available to the kids and to adults that have these sorts of problems. And so we thus have this new clinical psychology that's sort of uh, really hand in hand with education because a lot of it's pedagogy where they're trying to help these people learn to become uh, more proficient, whatever that is that they're having a disability about. So we'll come back, of course, to talking more about clinical psychology at a later lecture. The last thing I wanna to do today is talk about two more notable women in psychology at this time and I recommend at this point that if you ever have a chance that you look for this book called Untold Lives, The First Generation of American Women Psychologists by two historians, Elizabeth Scarborough and Laurel Furimoto. Um, they do a really excellent job here profiling several women around this time period, including the two women I'm about to talk about. Now, one of the things that they kind of point out early in the book is just trying to give you a good idea of the context that women who wanted to study psychology and then become professional uh, people in psychology had to face. This is sort of the kind of the two sort of big um, beliefs that they had to face. So the women at the 19th century, beginning of the 20th century, had two kind of beliefs that were believed by society. One was called the periodic function. And this was the belief that women were intellectually incapacitated every month during menstruation. So yes, um, people actually believed that women were intellectually incapacitated while they're menstruating. And then the other hypothesis that a lot of scientists believed in was what's called the variability hypothesis was that men showed more variability in their intelligence. So that, therefore their curve was spread out more than the women's abilities were. And that would mean that the brightest men would always be more intelligent than the brightest women. So these two beliefs caused a lot of barriers for women who wanted to go on into get a higher education. Despite these barriers though, some opportunities arose in the second half of the 19th century. And part of this was due to the fact that um, colleges uh, and universities started to allow women in to teach, to, sorry, to become students. At first, the things that they were taught were home economics. So that is, they were meant to come to the university or to the college to learn about how to sew, how to be a good cook, how to raise children. But later on, they decided that women needed to be teachers because as they started having compulsory education across the United States, they needed to educate women to become teachers. And so they opened up colleges, training schools just for women so they could learn to become teachers. Ivy League schools like Harvard and Yale resisted the efforts to have women enrolled at their particular colleges, but they compromised by creating women's schools that would be affiliated with the men's, such as what one of them was called the Harvard Annex that later became Radcliffe College. But the best opportunities for women really came with the creation of a new educational phenomenon, and these were elite colleges that were created for women only, such as Vassar College in 1865. Matthew Vassar had endured the, endowed this college with his money, he wrote, because it occurred to him that women having received from the creator the same intellectual constitution as man has the same right as man to intellectual culture and development. That's very progressive of him. Other colleges were similarly set up by philanthropists like Smith in 1871, Wellesley in 1875, Bryn Mawr in 1885. By 1901, there were 119 of these women's colleges in the United States. So now you had women who um, um, were getting educated in these colleges. At the same time as these colleges popped up, who is going to teach the women there? It seemed more appropriate at a women's college that women would be the teachers or the professors. So that required that women would have to go and get PhDs or some sort of advanced training so they could actually teach at these different women's colleges. So that's actually where these two women kind of come up. One of them was Christine Ladd Franklin. Um, she was born in Connecticut. And during her early childhood, she lived with her parents. Her dad was a merchant and she had a younger brother, Henry. And then they moved to, uh, and when they moved, she also had a sister. The family correspondence shows that, um, that the mother and her sisters were all staunch supporters of women's rights, even at a young age. Before she had celebrated her fifth birthday, her mother had taken her to a lecture given by Elizabeth Oak Smith, a well-known proponent of women's rights. 
And additionally, her father was a graduate professor who was supportive of Christine's efforts. Now, following the death of her mother in 1860 of pneumonia, Ladd went to live with her paternal grandmother in Portsmouth, New Hampshire, where she attended school. Her father remarried in 1862, and, had, and she had, had a half-sister, Catherine, and a half-brother, George. She was a precocious child who sought to find a mean to continue her education beyond secondary school, and her wish was granted when her father enrolled her in a two-year program at a co-educational academy in Massachusetts, and she took the same courses that prepared boys that were planning to go on to Harvard. In 1865, she graduated from there as the valedictorian, or the Ducks, and made the decision to pursue further education at Vassar College. So this was, again, supported by her family. So in 1866, she went off to Vassar on a, based on a loan from her aunt. She only studied at Vassar until the end of the spring term due to financial issues. During the time that she was not attending college, she worked as a public school teacher until her aunt's aide allowed her to reenter and graduate in 1869. While she was attending Vassar, she began working under the mentorship of an astronomy professor, a woman named Maria Mitchell, who was famous for having been the first woman to discover a new comet using a telescope in 1847. Mitchell was also a suffragette, and she strove to inspire women to gain more self-confidence in order to succeed in male-dominated fields during this period. Under the guidance of Mitchell, she was able to blossom and quickly developed a love for the fields of physics and mathematics. Since women in the 19th century were not allowed in the male-dominated physics laboratory, she was unable to pursue her first love of physics and chose instead to study mathematics. Later in life, she would eventually reflect back on her decision and say, had it not been for the impossibility in those days in the case of women of obtaining access to laboratory facilities, she would have eagerly gone on to study physics. In 1878, she was accepted into Johns Hopkins University with the help of James Sylvester, who was an English mathematician who had remembered some of her earlier works. Um, her application for the university fellowship was signed C. Ladd, and Hopkins offered the fellowship to her without realizing she was a woman. When they did realize this, the board moved to revoke the offer, but Sylvester insisted that Ladd should be his student, and so she was, and she held a fellowship at Hopkins for three years, but the trustees did not allow her name to be printed in the circulars with those of the other fellows for fear of setting a precedent. Furthermore, there was a lot of dissension over her continued presence, presence in the classes, so uh, it forced one of the original trustees to resign. Since Johns Hopkins did not really approve of co-education, she was initially allowed only in classes that were taught by Sylvester. But after displaying exceptional work in his courses, she was allowed to take courses with different professors. And even though she was just awarded a stipend, she was known as a fellow. During 1879 to 1880, she took classes with Charles Sanders Pierce, who had been called uh, the first you know, philosopher psychologist, and whom we talked about last week. She wrote her dissertation on the algebra of logic with Pierce as her thesis advisor. The dissertation was published in Studies in Logic in 1883. And she became the first woman really to receive formal graduate instruction in both math mathematics and symbolic logic. Since women were not allowed to graduate though from Hopkins, she was refused her PhD, although she was the first woman to complete all the requirements for a PhD at Hopkins. However, Hopkins eventually got around to granting her a PhD in 1927, 44 years after she had earned it, when she was now 78. She, in 1884, married a fellow class member, a guy named Fabian Frankel, who got his PhD in mathematics, and so she then became Christine Ladd-Franklin. She had two children, one of whom died in infancy. The other, Margaret Ladd-Franklin, became a prominent member in the women's suffrage movement. She often wrote of this injustice that she observed in the oppression of the female sex. In 1893, she attempted to pursue a teaching position at Johns Hopkins, but she was denied. And despite the setback, she remained persistent and she determined. And um, she never actually was able to secure a regular ac academic position because she was married. Um, that is, in order to be able to be hired as a teacher at a university or even at a school, you had to be single. And because she was married with a child, she was not allowed to have a regular academic position. Eleven years later, in 1904, she was at least given permission to teach one class per year. And for the next five years, her position at Johns Hopkins had to be approved and renewed on a yearly basis all the way up until 1909. Women who were fortunate enough to obtain academic positions in universities at this time 
often chose these positions despite their lack of compensation, so she was no different from that. Many of the teaching positions that she held were on a volunteer basis, which created a substantial financial strain on her and her family. But she placed a high value on all this, and so she became a successful contributor to the field. I just should have said before we move on here that one of her major contributions that she made to psychology was her theory of color vision, which was based on evolution. Lad Franklin noted that some animals are colorblind and assumed that the achromatic vision appeared first in evolution and that color vision must have come later. She assumed further that the human eye carries fragments of its earlier evolutionary development. She observed that the most highly evolved part of the eye is the fovea, where, at least in daylight, visual acuity and color sensitivity are greatest. She assumed that peripheral vision, which was provided by the rods of the retina, was more primitive than foveal vision because night vision and movement detection were crucial for survival. So she was really showing how color vision was linked on this evolutionary dimension. I'm going to mention uh, at the end of this in a few minutes her battle with Titchener and Titchener's sexism, um, especially when it came to the experimentalist. But before I do that, I want to introduce one more person, and that's Margaret Floyd Washburn, who lived from 1871 to 1939. She was born in New York City. She was raised in Harlem by her father, Francis, who was an Episcopal priest, and her mother, Elizabeth Floyd, who, became a who came from a prosperous New York family. Um, she was an only child. She did not appear to have childhood companions her age and spent much of her time with adults or reading. She learned to read long before she started school. This caused her to advance quickly when she started school at age seven. In school, she learned French and German, and when she was 11 years old, she started at public school for the first time. In 1886, she graduated from high school at the age of 15, and that fall, she entered Vassar College. Um, she was only admitted as a preparatory student because she hadn't taken enough Latin and French. But during this time, she developed a strong interest in philosophy through poetry and other literary works. Um, and she was finally introduced to the field of psychology. After she graduated from Vassar in 1891, she became determined to study under James McKean Cattell and his new psychological laboratory at Columbia. But Columbia wasn't admitting any women graduate students, so she was only admitted as an auditor of the class. So she would sit in there and not get credit. Despite the derogatory feelings towards women gaining ed education at that time, Cattell treated her as a normal student and became her first mentor. She attended his seminary, his lectures, and worked in his lab si laboratory alongside the men. At the end of her first year of admission at Columbia, she encour Cattell encouraged her to enter the newly organized Sage School of Philosophy at Cornell University to obtain her PhD because this would not have been possible at Columbia because she was just an auditor. So she was accepted in 1891 with a scholarship to go to Cornell. So at Cornell, she studied under Titchener and his, became his first and only major graduate student at that time. As a graduate student, she conducted an experimental study of the methods of equivalences and tactual perception, as was suggested by her advisor, Titchener. After two semesters of experimental psychology, she subsequently earned her master's degree uh, from Vassar in absentia in the late spring of 1893. During that time, she started working on another master's thesis, which was done on visual imagery. In June 1894, she gave her oral presentation and became the first woman to receive a PhD in psychology um, from Cornell with Titchener as her advisor. She was also elected to the newly established American Psychological Association. Her master's dissertation was also sent by Titchener to Wilhelm Wundt, who translated it and published it in his German Philosophical Studies in 1895. Following her graduation, she was offered the Chair of Psychology, Philosophy, and Ethics at Wells College in Aurora, New York. She accepted the offer and was spent the next six years there. While she was there, she would make sure to visit Cornell to catch up with her friends and work in the laboratories. However, she got tired of that place, and so in 1900, she went to um, Sage College of Cornell University, and she accepted that offer and spent the next two years there, and then eventually ended up at the University of Cincinnati in Cincinnati, Ohio, where she took full charge of the psychology department. But in the spring of 1903, she returned to Vassar College as an associate professor of philosophy, where she remained the rest of her life. When she started working there, she became the head of the newly founded psychology department. She treated her students well, and in turn, they appreciated her as a professor. A large number of her students continued to advance in the field of psychology after graduation, 
She published many of her students' studies during her career. The students would collect and work with the data while she wrote up and published the experiments. Between the years of 1905 and 1938, she published 68 studies from the Vassar Undergraduate Laboratory. These studies were the largest series of studies from any American university at the time. At one point, her students gifted her with a large sum of money, and they wanted her to use that money for leisure. Instead, she used the money as a scholarship aid to help students in the psychology department. So you can see some of the other accomplishments on here that she also published a, a book on comparative psychology called The Animal Mind in 1908. She had her own motor theory of consciousness that was akin to some of those ideas that William James had had about the importance of motor movements and cognition. Keep in mind that in order to have all these jobs teaching, it's because she never married. And so being a single woman, she was allowed to have these kind of occupations. She did become the president of the American Psychological Association in 1922, and she also had membership to the National Academy of Sciences in 1931. So again, I mentioned these two women at this particular time because they're contemporaries with some of the other people that were doing the testing stuff. I wanted to end this lecture by talking to you again about some of the um, problems that these women had with people like Titchener. So it's interesting that Titchener was Margaret Floyd Washburn's advisor, right? But Titchener and his colleagues would never really allow women to be part of the, of the, of the club. So they were always excluded from all sorts of important networks of scientific psychologists. So like for instance, here in 1909, not a single woman is standing in the photograph because they wouldn't have been allowed to participate even though you had some women who would have had degrees and could have easily talked to Freud and Jung. Another important group, and by the way, you can see Titchener here, he's on the front row, second person from the left. Um, so he, he got to show up, but the people that he was associated with, women were not allowed to come. Then even himself, he had his group, the experimentalists, they started in 1916, and only men were allowed to join. And part of the reason he argued was that these men would get together and smoke cigars, and women were not supposed to smoke cigars. And so he believed that allowing the group to only be men would allow these men to relax more, and they would have more creative ideas, and they could smoke cigars and talk and, and uh, talk about psychology without any... Um, compunction to have to behave in a particular way if women are around. It's, uh, it's been reported that some women would actually sneak into these meetings and hide under the table so they could listen to the discussion of the men um, so that they could kind of keep up with what was going on. The experimentalists kept going on and on and on for many decades. Um, they also eventually became the Society of Experimental Psychology. You can always see in these photos, this, here's another one in 1927 in um, the University of Pennsylvania. They're all again um, some of them are hold, holding on to their cigars. Um, one of his students that uh, was really important, I mentioned of Titchener's, Titchener's the guy in the middle there with the big white beard. Off to the right there, in the far right, you can see there's a little guy there with a little mustache. Um, that's Boring, his student, who went on and became a professor at Harvard and wrote these histories of psychology texts. So there is Boring in the picture. Here's another picture of that same group now known as the Society of Experimental Psychologists in 1935 at Yale University. And finally, there's a woman in the picture. And that woman is Margaret Floy Washburn, who's seated in the second row, fourth from the left. So you can see her there. And the other person that I can point out again here is Boring. Boring is seated, seated in that second row down on the far right. And he's got his little bow tie and his glasses on. And there's Boring. Um, but that's the Society of Experimental Psychologists, and the name had changed from the experimentalists after Titchener had died. So and this, the reason why Titchener's not in this photo is he had passed away by this point, and now they were called the Society of Experimental Psychologists. The Society of Experimental Psychologists is still around. It's still considered a very prestigious organization. You have to be voted on um, to be in the, um, into this club, this group. You can see here from their webpage um, it says there on the third paragraph, the meetings are plenary and involve papers from various members of the society. The society currently admits at least six new members annually from among the leading experimentalists in North America. So they have to come from North America. It has a current membership of 220 individuals, about 5 to 10% of the practicing experimental psychologists. So in a way, what they're kind of saying is they're only taking the cream of the crop. The only people who are allowed to join the Society of Experimental Psychologists are the top 5 to 10% that are getting voted in. And so if women are not allowed to join this really exclusive club for decades, you can kind of see how that would have an impact then on how psychology is going to progress in all these different universities. 
so in fact, if you look at the different photos of the SCP over the decades, you can very rarely ever see a woman in there. It's not really until you get to the 2000s that you regularly see women. Here's a picture from 2005. And if you look carefully there, you can see maybe seven women that are in the picture, but most of them, again, are um, males. And then in 2015, they have a few more women here. I thought it was funny. There's two guys here that didn't get into the picture, so they've just kind of cut pasted their photos in. But again, there's just a few handful of women. I think this looks most promising, though. In 2018, you can see when they met that there are many more women in the club now. And so now perhaps they're starting to get close to equity. But again, I just want to point out, it's a long time there from back in the days when Titchener originally had this as a group of guys that would hang around with their cigars and the women have to wait and hide underneath the tables in order to catch on to what the conversations were about. It took a long time to get it to integrate it to the point that you see here in this particular photo. So I'll leave you here with a quote from Christine Ladd Franklin, who kept a journal throughout most of her life. And she also gave speeches. And here she is giving a speech in 1904 about why there should be endowed professorships for women at different universities. What she's doing is she's complaining here a bit about the fact that women just still are not allowed to have jobs at top universities. She says, that is the case with our clever girls. They go to Germany and get the parchments, beautifully signed and sealed, that proclaim them to be doctors of philosophy, but no further consequences follow. They have nothing but the empty satisfaction of exhibiting their tickets. So they go off to these European universities and get PhDs in physics or chemistry or whatever it is, and they come back to the America and they can't get a job at one of the top universities because they are a woman or because they're married. Um, so that's just kind of how Christine Ladd Franklin talked about it in 1904. So that's all I have for today's lecture. I look forward to talking to you again at the next lecture.